have you here. Thank you. Um, nice to be here. So this interview is with Phidias Sotiriu. Yes. Um, who has been with the UKTS from the beginning. Uh, well, I'm uh, 77 at the moment and uh, I was introduced to thalassemia quite by accident uh, back in uh, 1974, 70, 75 I think, when uh, I was a police officer in the area of Holloway in London. I'm, I'm uh, the father of two children, uh, a girl and a boy. At the time, uh, there was a, a bad accident that happened uh, on night duty and the police officer lost both his legs. Uh, I won't go into details about that. but. Uh, uh, I decided I was going to do something for his family and raise some funds to see them through the difficult times. Going back to the 70s now, I decided to organize a, an austerity meal in, in my attempt to raise some funds for the family. And I, I think you're aware of austerity mm -hmm. uh, dinners. You pay a lot of money to go to them and all you get is a slice of bread if you're lucky. But of course the profits are increased. On that day, I, I, I recall, I started work early in the morning because I had to go and arrest some people. And uh, one of those I arrested was a, a drug addict. And he was obviously in no fit state to be interviewed. So. Uh, we had to call the police doctor, the police surgeon, to come and t treat him and then give me the okay when it was uh, clear for me to interview the prisoner. And I was told it would be a, a couple of hours before the doctor uh, comes to the police station. So I decided to go and sell some of the tables for this austerity meal. And I was in a, in a store. Uh, near the police station and as I walked in uh, the owner recognized me. I was in the CID so I wasn't wearing a uniform. The owner recognized me and he said, oh hello Mr. Fidia, what are you selling today and how much is it? <laughs> <laughs> so I had made a name for myself and uh, I explained to him what happened and why I was uh, trying to sell tables for this austerity meal. He said, okay, uh, I'll buy a table and take those tickets and sell them again. That, that's, that's really yeah. In that store, there was another gentleman looking at garments. He was a, a lady's uh, dresses. Uh, he came over to me, he says, are you Mr. Sotiriu, the police officer? So I said, yes. He said, oh, I heard a lot about you and uh, the things you do for people in need. Have you ever thought of helping us? He was Greek as well. So I said, uh, I, I don't understand. I said, well, what do you mean? So he said, well, uh, I, I belong to thalassemia. We are struggling to get uh, going. We could do with someone like you to help us with our cause. I said, Thala what? He said, Thalassemia. I said, what, what is that? He said, uh, are you available this evening? So I said, yes, why? He said, if you come to my house, I'll give you my address. If you come to my house, he said, uh, I will introduce you to Thalassemia. And uh, we'll take it from there. I agreed to... Uh, go and visit him that evening. And uh, when I went there, he led me into the sitting room and he said, uh, my wife is upstairs uh, bathing the children and uh, she will be down soon. And then I heard kids crying upstairs and I looked at him, he guessed that I was a bit concerned about the crying. And he says, don't, don't worry, he said, uh, uh, they are thalassemics and uh, they are having their treatment. Treatment being the desferol that uh, they, they were having at the time. 
and I, I, I was lost. I, I didn't know anything about all that. But cut a long story short, uh, he led me upstairs and I saw the kids, and it was a boy and a girl, and uh, I couldn't help thinking that they were the same age as uh, my two, and the circumstances of putting my kids to bed were entirely different from that. The complete opposite. We would joke and play and read uh, little books, you know, and things like that, and get them off to sleep happy, not crying. And uh, that's how I was introduced to thalassemia, okay. uh, which then led to him telling me that a number of parents of thalassemic children in London got together and uh, in those days we had those infusion pumps, uh, very big ones, mm -hmm. and uh, not everybody could afford them. Parents were sharing their pumps. So if, if the infusion would last six or eight hours, it meant that you could get three or four uh, different uh, families involved with the same pump, roughly. And I agreed to go and meet the, those parents that were trying to do something about it, which introduced me to what is now known as UKTS, uh, UK Thalassemia Society, which did not really exist. It was just the parents of a, a, a few little children getting together, but not knowing what to do next. So I met with a group of them, and when I heard their stories, I said, right, uh, uh, I will make a pledge, be with you, and uh, help you as much as I can, and make sure that every one of the children has his or her own pump, as we used to call them the infusion pumps then. That's how I got involved with uh, thalassemia, pledging to help them achieve that at least. And of course everything else after that is probably my own fault because I, 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 I got too involved with thalassemia and I just couldn't uh, let go. Um, so I became their fundraiser. And I had to come up with ideas of how to raise money. I, I, I was in a privileged position because I was, uh, I was the first Greek to join Scotland Yard. And I managed to get into the community a lot easier than anybody else mm -hmm. would have. Uh, so the story began then. And I was uh, involved when... Uh, uh, from a parents' gathering evening, it became a thalassemia meeting at the first premises that uh, the society had, which was uh, thanks to the donation of uh, an Arab prince. Uh, and uh, the premises were uh, bought for thalassemia offices. It started growing from there. In those days, the children were being treated for anemia. The biggest advice was, oh, give him plenty of liver, you know, and things like that, which was completely the wrong thing to do. And to the best of my knowledge, two uh, doctors uh, were working on this uh, strange anemia. One was in the States, his name was Cooley, and one was in Cyprus, his name was Fodri. And uh, they were both working, but independently, uh, on this strange anemia. And uh, that's why in parts of the world, thalassemia is also known as Cooley's anemia, mm -hmm. because he identified the different strain of thalassemia, or, yeah, of uh, anemia. And uh, others 
uh, call it uh, Mediterranean anemia, which is what Dr. Fautry named the condition then. I was surrounded by all these people who were so determined to do something about it. But of course, I said, the span of life averaged between 16 and 18 and uh, in those days. And that was because uh, the original uh, treatment was uh, give him this and give him that or whatever, which was completely the wrong thing and uh, it created bigger problems. But then uh, things started uh, changing and Desferol came into use. Uh, it was manufactured by Sibagaiki and uh, it gave some hope to the patients. Having said that, my experience was that uh, yes, it was available, but only to those who could afford it. And uh, thalassemics in the UK and in the States and some other uh, countries uh, were given uh, the desferol, either free or uh, cheap enough, but thousands and thousands of others in uh, other countries like India, Pakistan, that I visited personally couldn't afford that. I was surprised at the number of uh, children in uh, places like India and Pakistan that I visited. Uh, that were dying undiagnosed, having not been seen even once by a doctor. I'm talking about remote villages. So uh, I felt there was a need to do something about it. And my first aim was uh, to make sure that every thalassemic child in the UK that I was aware of uh, would have their own pump and get their own desferon. And I pledged to the society that it became, soon after that it became a society, uh, that I would be with them to achieve that. And I started raising funds. Lo and behold, every child managed to get their own uh, pumps. Uh, and then it progressed from there, uh, where I wanted to see how children of the same disorder uh, were being treated elsewhere, especially in third world countries. And I, I visited a few and I saw the, the problems they had. And that spurred me to keep going on and on and on, helping mm -hmm. uh, as much as I could and bringing people together and uh, in my role as the fundraiser for UK Thalassemia Society, uh, I did a lot of traveling, uh, but the main thing was uh, the people I was surrounded by, they, they spurred me on. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was no end to uh, the fundraising in a nice way. I was also known as the thalassemia beggar because uh, all I did was, uh, was raise money for yeah, the getting people to put their hands in their pockets and uh, uh, helping the cause. But you would have raised a lot of awareness as well whilst you were doing that. Yes, yes. Especially uh, in the Greek community where people, yes. where it was still unknown. Yes. Most important priority I gave I wanted thalassemia to be a household name. Mm -hmm. uh, it started off, in my case, with the Cypriot community, because that's how I just explained yes. how it started. But then I realized that the Asian community were affected by it as well, you know, so I started appealing to them as well. And uh, eventually we grew uh, as a society. And uh, I, I met people from all sorts of countries. One day I walked into my office and there was a docket on my desk from Scotland Yard. I opened it, I read it, and it was a request from the president of Pakistan, Zia. He was the president of Pakistan at the time. He heard of my efforts. 
he officially invited me to go to Pakistan and help him with this problem, which I thought it was quite an honor, really. Um, and cutting a long story short, I did go to Pakistan. Uh, I was met by the president. And as I recall things, I arrived in Pakistan the week when Bhutto was getting married, the daughter of the previous president, Bhutto. Okay. She was getting married, but in Pakistan they celebrated for the whole week leading to her actual wedding. And everybody was out in the streets dancing and uh, enjoying themselves. And then another thing I found out was that President Zia had not made a public appearance for seven years that he was in office, and yet he wanted me to help him uh, raise funds for uh, thalassemia. Well, I was introduced to a hospital in Karachi. I was introduced to a hospital in Islamabad, and I was introduced to another uh, hospital in Lahore. You know, and I'm talking about a couple of hours flight from one to the other, you know, uh, and nothing in between. So all those uh, children uh, that were dying undiagnosed couldn't even dream of getting to any of these. Uh, yeah. So uh, I came back and I said to President Zia that. Uh, if you want me to help you, uh, you will have to make an appearance. I cannot go on stage on my own. And uh, uh, he organized a function. I think he invited something like 1,200 people as his personal guests uh, to attend the function in a huge hotel. It was uh, broadcast uh, nationwide. He was making his first appearance, at, uh, in public appearance, at this function. And uh, you can imagine the streets were littered with army personnel and police officers, you know, for the safety. He made a speech. We were sitting on the uh, stage. I was sitting to his right, and he made a speech. Uh, is it Urdu they speak there? Something like that. I so. um, uh, but I could hear the name Fidias, you know, being uttered from time to time in Scotland Yard, you know, coming up. Then he told me that the stage was mine. And I got up and started what I used to do for uh, UKTS, mm -hmm. trying to raise money and awareness. And uh, I remember, after the introduction, a gentleman in a wheelchair coming out towards me to the stage. And he had a briefcase on his lap. There was nobody pushing him or anything. He was doing it himself. He came and he handed me the briefcase. I didn't know what was in the briefcase, and quite honestly, I was a bit concerned whether to open it or not. <laughs> At the time, the, the thought had crossed my mind, but I thought, no, it, it, it's okay. So I opened it, and uh, I found out there was half a million US dollars in there. Okay. And of course, that was the very first donation. Now, I understood at the time that uh, there was a, a lot of drilling going on in the sea outside Karachi for uh, petrol. And the company that was doing it, there was one together with uh, the Pakistani government. And he was the chairman of this company. And he made a donation, a huge donation. And of course, that followed by others making their own donations. And I stressed 
the importance of having units uh, between cities to make it easy for people in villages to get somewhere mm -hmm. for the treatment. And I was surprised how many people were donating land, building material, uh, you name it, everything. And uh, it turned out to be a very, very successful uh, night. That made a huge difference to Pakistan. If that wasn't an inspiration to continue, I don't know what was. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I did that. And uh, then uh, a young scientist came to the society and introduced himself to me as Dr. George Gondoyorgis, and he said, I want to have a little chat with you, and uh, he told me that uh, he felt that uh, he could develop uh, an oral chelator. Didn't know what an oral chelator was, but he did explain, it was a tablet, uh, that could do exactly the same thing as uh, infusion with uh, uh, desferol. And I thought, wow, sounds great. Uh, why, why should we have our uh, thalassemics uh, attached to a pump, you know, for so many hours every day? I thought he would definitely, he meant what he was saying. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, if you can uh, provide the funds, I will do the research. And I promise you one day, I will present you with uh, a tablet that does exactly the same. And I, I, I did believe him. He was so sincere. So I put all my baskets, all my eggs in the same basket and uh, decided I was going to concentrate uh, on raising funds now for this research. And what year was this? 76, 77, maybe, mm -hmm. something like that. And. Uh, Uh, he worked at uh, the Royal Free Hospital in Hampstead. He was so devoted to his uh, research, and we know the result of it. Uh, <laughs> I do recall one uh, evening uh, he called me and said, uh, are you available to come to the lab? So I said, uh, yes, why? He said, come, come. He said, I've got some news for you. I went. It, it, it was late in the evening. And uh, he made me drink so much water, it was uh, untrue, you know. A couple of uh, bottles of water, <laughs> drink that, drink that, drink that. <laughs> and then he gives me this tablet and uh, he said, now we wait. So we waited. He says, when you're ready and you want to pass urine, he says, uh, let me know. <laughs> Here is uh, a beaker, use that. And I did, and it was all red. He said, success. So that was the birth of L1. You're doing, you're doing. <laughs> <coughs> so L1, we knew that uh, uh, George Kondoyorgis was on the right track despite other scientists trying to convince the society that uh, we're wasting our money, you know, it would never happen. Mm -hmm. Desferol would never be replaced by uh, an oral chelator. And uh, I pinned all my hopes on George. We went through the animal uh, trials, you know, and everything. And then we came to the clinical uh, trials, but uh, although we did approach uh, Sibagaiki to help us with that, because it would have meant a lot of organization, uh, they reluctantly refused to do it. So George and I went to India 
and uh, in India uh, there was a pharmaceutical company called Cipla okay. and the Asian parents made sure that contact was made between me and uh, George Kondayorgis and uh, Cipla and George and I went to Bombay, where is Mumbai now, uh, where Cipla is uh, situated and we saw the owner of uh, the company. George explained all the scientific <laughs> things to them, addressed uh, the company, and they seemed impressed by it. And uh, he said, uh, we need uh, uh, to carry out clinical trials before, you know, for the completion. And uh, the uh, CIPLA agreed to help us do that. And I flew to New Delhi, had a meeting with the uh, Ministry of Health, and I managed to secure a bigger number of uh, thalassemics in different hospitals, boys, girls, young men, young women, you know, uh, to carry out these uh, clinical trials and uh, eventually it all went through and uh, the L1 uh, became uh, a substitute for the Tesferol. So that's how it happened. Um, at one of uh, my sometimes stupid uh, things I did to raise money, uh, I decided to do a jailbreak, to be locked up in a prison. And uh, I managed to convince uh, one of my very, very best friends. In fact, we call each other brother. And do you know what? A lot of the Cypriot community, even today, think that we are brothers, yeah. but we are not. We're not <laughs> related at all. His name is Avram, Avram Dimitriou. He's uh, a dentist. And uh, we're very, very close, even up to now. We, we even go t on holidays together, you know. Um, so, I decided I'm not going to do this jailbreak on my own. I'd better get him involved as well. <laughs> <laughs> and persuaded him to come uh, with me for this jailbreak. So we printed out the forms. We wanted sponsors, you know, people that would sponsor him and me, uh, him meaning Avram, uh, to see how much distance we can travel uh, in prison uniform without a penny in our pockets before we are arrested by any of the sponsors. Okay. Okay? So the community liked the idea. And they said, oh, put me down for 50 pounds a mile or whatever. I said, no, 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 no. Just make a donation. Don't say per mile. What I didn't tell anybody, including Avram, was that uh, <laughs> uh, my plan was uh, to use a helicopter to hook us up from the prison and take us to Gatwick, where... Uh, through the job I was doing at the time, uh, I was uh, introduced to an American airline uh, who donated two return tickets to New York. And uh, him and I would be flown to Gatwick. Our passports I would give to the uh, special branch at uh, uh, 
Gatwick in advance so that we come out of the helicopter and straight on to the aeroplane before the aeroplane takes off. And then destination New York. <laughs> and that's what we did. Uh, but by then, Avram was aware of the, uh, the destination. My original plan was uh, we finish, because another friend of his, uh, another dentist, uh, offered to do a video of this uh, jailbreak. And uh, uh, Avram's cousin was uh, a member of the Cyprus de delegation to the United Nations. And uh, he put us up in his apartment in New York. And he met us at the airport so that we could walk out in our prison uniforms, <laughs> you know, without being arrested. And uh, all that. But most importantly, uh, they set up uh, a reception at the United Nations and I had to address uh, the United Nations on the needs of thalassemia internationally, which gave us good footing. Yeah. So then we would be arrested. Uh, we gave up the Alcatraz uh, <laughs> original idea because we were running out of time. And we were arrested. I don't know if you've ever been to New York. Yeah. Right. Well, you, do, do you know where the United Nations mm -hmm. Well, you know the road that runs in front of yes. it. We had to run from the United Nations across the road, being chased by uh, an American police officer with his gun. <laughs> and I remember, uh, whilst we were having the reception at the United Nations, this gentleman came over and he said to me, Officer, can I see you a moment? I didn't know who he was but he was the British ambassador to the United uh, <laughs> Nations, he introduced himself to me in private, uh, in a corner. <laughs> and he says to me, I understand you and your friend are going to run across the road and being chased by uh, a police officer. And, and then uh, I said, yes. He says, have you been to the States before? So I said, no. He said, uh, are you aware how many people in the States are around? And uh, I said, why? He says, well, they don't like seeing police officers chasing prisoners and not doing anything. Mm. So they won't think twice about pulling their own gun and shooting you. <laughs> <laughs> Avram's reaction was, you're doing this on your own? <laughs> <laughs> But that didn't last very long. Anyway, so we agreed to do it. And of course, all the traffic, mm. I think it's about four lanes of traffic on each side, uh, came to a stop, you know. And when we got over to the other side, it was like a, a, a footway, huge footway with very big uh, uh, flower uh, beds, huge ones. And we just dived there, behind them, the concrete went behind them, and the officer mm -hmm. came, and that was the end of the filming. So we decided we're not going to do Alcatraz, definitely. <laughs> 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 but uh, that, that was a, a, a good opportunity going to the States, because then I met uh, a man called Bob Ficara. Mm -hmm. um, he ran the Kulis Anemia uh, Society in, uh, in the States. And I can't remember the other gentleman's name. Uh, he, was, he was a Greek because the, the Greeks had their own little association to do with yeah. thalassemia. And the rest of them had Kulis Anemia. And uh, I was introduced to both of them. and. We sat down and I said, well, look, is there a real need to have a Greek one and uh, uh, everything else on? Why don't you merge together? And, and that led to the formation of TIF, Thalassemia International Federation. Okay. 
So that was the birth of uh, Tiff. Uh, if all these names mean something to you, it shows you the sort of people I was surrounded mm. by. They were committed. Uh, they were determined to do something. And uh, it worked. <laughs>